am recording. Scott, you're ready to go. And All I would right. ask everyone who's not speaking to please mute themselves. And uh, welcome to the meeting. Yes. So once again, uh, we're having our uh, monthly chapter meeting using our favorite uh, app, Zoom. And I believe we'll uh, do that uh, for another two months um, before we uh, make a decision um, next month, whether we're gonna try to get together or uh, just continue it this way. Everybody probably would rather uh, continue this way so they can just uh, have their sweats on underneath. Um, let's see, uh, we do have quite a few participants. Is there any new members or those joining our Zoom meetings for the first time? Raise the hands. William? Yes. Why don't you give a little introduction about yourself? Uh, my name is William Berg. I recently retired about six months ago from the city and county of Denver. So I have a bit more time on my hands. I managed uh, a wastewater laboratory there. We did everything from wastewater checking all the way to South Platte River analysis. Um, and then from there, it uh, kind of bloomed and I retired out of there. And now I got lots of time to fish and tie flies. And so I'm getting back into the game. So about 90% of the folks on the line here too did that. <laughs> Let's see, anybody else? Uh, Steve. Uh, Steve Starlipper, also retired about a year and a half ago. Um, tried to start to get into flying fly fishing last summer with COVID. Uh, had a couple of missteps. So looking forward to getting into it this year. And I appreciate everyone's time. And I look forward to meeting a lot of you. Very good. Thank you, Steve. Uh, let's see. There's a lot uh, without uh, video on. Oh, Maddie? Yes, I'm not sure why it's logged under my daughter's name, but it's oh. Mickey. Um, Mickey, and um, this is my first meeting. I may have to leave early, um, but uh, my family is into fly fishing, so I just um, decided to join up and took a lesson with Brian two weeks ago. Haven't really been able to practice because of the weather, but um, looking forward to it. Hey, Mickey, good to see you. Right. Another Friday night. Mickey, did I spell your name right? Um, I don't, yeah, actually, yeah. <laughs> okay. Spell it that way, yes. All right, good. Let's see. Jim Rasmussen is coming in. Let's see, anybody else? First time uh, meeting, first time member. Hey, I saw Ralph Christie sneak in. Go ahead and introduce yourself. You have to unmute if you're muted. All right, can you see me? We can hear you. What's yeah, the thing that Ralph says Christ start video. Yeah, <laughs> this is Ralph Christie. I'm a, a retiree as well, and uh, was invited by Brian Young, so I'm here to learn. Very good. I thought I saw. Let's see, Brian, you had your hand up. Hey, yeah, yeah, Brian Nagley here. Uh, this is my girlfriend, Katie. <laughs> oh, two for. There you go. Uh, yeah, we've been here in Denver for about three years, but um, and I'm a I'm a life member to you, but I haven't been able to like really mark my calendar for meetings or anything so i finally did <laughs> so here i am very good welcome all right and i don't see any others okay well welcome everybody and uh, thank you for joining us tonight um before we get into the presentations for this evening i think uh, we have two uh board members that want to make some announcements. So George, I will turn the floor over to you, first of all. 
Well, thanks, Scott. Let me share my screen here. Want to welcome everybody tonight and to let you know that we are back in the conservation business. So we are going to have a conservation project this Saturday in honor of Earth Day, which is Thursday. And, uh, and we're going to meet at just before 8 o'clock. Um, and we're going to work until noon on the Bear Creek Green Belt. And we are going to be planting some native plants like uh, plum and, and cottonwood and helping to restore that riparian environment. We would love to have you with us. This is entirely an outdoor um, safe event in terms of COVID. And so you probably saw this newsletter where I'm sharing my screen. And this came out recently. And uh, we also have information about tonight's meeting as well as our Come Fish With Us program and then the event that I'm talking about. And so we would love to have you sign up. Um, we will have uh, unfortunately no uh, coffee or breakfast, which is normal for that event, but we will have a grab and go for lunch uh, at 12 o'clock. So please come and join us. And if you need any information about that, you can email me. Uh, here is my email information. It's georgefr at aol.com. I'm George Franklin. And here's my phone number. You might take a moment to write that down. And if you forget that, uh, you can go to our website and, um, and my contact information is there. So we would love to see you just before eight this coming Saturday at the Stone House. This is the address, 2900 South Estes Street in Lakewood. And we are going to be doing some planting and honoring Mother Nature. So if you have any questions, um, please ask them now and I'd be happy to field them. George, how are we doing on the uh, 20 maximum volunteer uh, uh, sign up sheet? We were hoping for 20. We've had a couple recent cancellations. We sit 13. So oh. we could certainly use some volunteers. Okay. Are there any other questions? All right. Thanks, George. You're very welcome. Let's see. Um, John, uh, you uh, had a few comments to make uh, from the Blue Moose Committee. Good evening, everyone. I do. Uh, let me first start by uh, announcing that on July 10th, we are going to do a South Platte cleanup. It'll be a morning time event. Uh, we're hoping to clean up um, starting at the YMCA, the boundary there and going all the way down, uh, maybe as, as far as uh, the road up to um, Sedalia. But we'll, uh, we'll have more on that, just uh, something to put on your calendar. July 10th, Saturday. So uh, the Bull Moose Committee, for those of you that aren't aware, is a, a group of people that are volunteers for Colorado Trout Unlimited. And we monitor a number of the legislative activities that are going on inside of Colorado. Um, and we, we help CTU make decisions on whether they're going to support this activity or oppose it. Um, so I wanted to uh, let people know about one thing that is coming up uh, caused, called the PAWS initiative. It's called Protect Animals from Unnecessary Suffering and Exploitation. Uh, it was discussed at the last Bull Moose Committee meeting and it was discussed on Saturday at the CTU uh, board meeting. CTU is gonna strongly oppose this initiative. Uh, we expect that people will start being asked to sign uh, petitions this summer. The intent of the petitions is to get this on the ballot in 2022. Uh, we have some specific things that we're concerned about. The ag community is very concerned about it because it would make a lot of the work that the ag community does and what veterinarians do illegal. 
Um, and we can talk about that. I don't want to waste a lot of time on that. But from a TU perspective, it threatens uh, our Trout in the Classroom program, specifically uh, testing uh, those fish that are raised in the classroom are tested before they're released at the end of the school year. That testing uh, involves uh, ensuring they're disease free, but it involves uh, destroying some of the fish that could easily become illegal, probably would be illegal under this uh, uh, law should it be uh, uh, put in place. And it also will require the ag community to keep animals alive for 25% uh, of the lifespan of that particular species. And that'll be defined in the law. Cattle will have to be um, kept alive for five years. Uh, normally they're uh, slaughtered for meat in the two year time frame. The concern for TU is uh, this will really impact the work we're doing, reducing overgrazing uh, and improving um, fencing and bank stability uh, along streams because of the, the farmer's requirement to keep uh, cattle, uh, we would assume, um, for a longer period of time and keep more of them. So um, we, we can uh, discuss this in more detail if anybody has any questions uh, or if anybody's got any questions about anything else that uh, is going on inside the state legislature, I can speak to some of the um, uh, things that, uh, some of the initiatives that CTU is monitoring. Anybody have any questions about that? All right, thank you very much. All right, thank you, John. I have one question. Is, is CTU a stakeholder at those meetings? At what meetings? With, with any of the meetings as far as the state legislature, uh, you know, looking at pause and things like that? CTU uh, has a, a full-time individual that is, is on uh, inside the Capitol building working with uh, the different elected, represent, resent, <laughs> elected <laughs> representatives. And, um, but we are not um, a group that has actually proposed any particular law. Uh, we uh, work with other conservation organizations to support or, or not different potential laws uh, that are uh, being worked by uh, the legislative branch of the state. Does that well, answer your question? It does. It does to a certain degree. Yes. Thank you. Okay, John, thank you so much. Yeah, that uh, I read that uh, synopsis on the, the pause and it sounded very, uh, ominous for what we try to do and I'm sure the ag people so uh, something to keep a watch on I'm sure uh, you'll be uh, approached for signing the, uh, the you know the initiative to get it on the ballot so uh, let's uh, keep an eye on that let's see um, on, the, on the schedule for next month uh, the chapter meeting we'll have uh, two conservation people discussing their area. Uh, first of all, we have our uh, Colorado State University scholarship re recipient that uh, we uh, support every year uh, talking about bacterial kidney disease in the Colorado trout. So uh, interesting to hear that. And then we also have a member from CPW talking about the Upper South Platte Greenback Restoration Project updates. So two good, uh, two good discussions. So uh, put that on your calendar, May 18th, and uh, we should have a good turnout for that. Let's see, turning into tonight's discussion, our uh, first speaker is Michael Painter. Uh, she uh, represents the, uh, 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 let me just start. The, the South Platte River Rangers program was introduced in 2020 by way of a grant uh, provided by the South Platte Enhancement Board to help educate visitors and alleviate some of the overuse pressures that the South Platte watershed and in particular Cheeseman Canyon were experiencing 
last year in 2020. Uh, tonight, we're fortunate to have Michael Painter here. She's a wildlife biologist since uh, 2009 for the South Platte R Ranger District. And she'll be speaking about the evolution of this critical pro pro program and as it continues uh, into 2021. Michael grew up in Colorado, went to CSU for a bachelor's in wildlife biology and earned a master's degree in forestry at Northern Arizona University. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming Michael to the Cutthroat Chapter Zoom meeting. Um, thank you, Scott, so much. I am um, honestly really uh, pleasantly surprised to see how many folks have joined the meeting tonight. Um, I think the last time I went to a TU meeting in person, oh golly, I think there was only about 10, 10 or 12 people there. <laughs> so this is great to have so many people here. Um, yeah, as Scott said, I'm the Fish and Wildlife Biologist for South Platte Ranger District. And um, uh, George and Scott asked me to share a little bit about um, the reasons why we started the River Patrol program last year and how we did it and um, how, it, uh, how it was funded and then what our plans are for, um, for continuing that, that program into the future. So I will start screen sharing. Um, let me know if you can see my slide presentation. Yep, yes, Kaylee, it looks up. wonderful. Now, All would right. you like everyone to hold their questions until the end? Uh, well, I think um, if people want to uh, include some questions in the chat and, and George or Scott, if you guys want to keep an eye on that chat window for me, um, and, and bring up any questions as we go along. As I said, we, I don't have very many slides. I only have about seven or eight slides. Um, but then when we get to the end of the presentation, of course, I'll open it up for more general discussion as well, too. So Sound if we good? could have everyone mute themselves, and if you've got a question, throw it up in the chat box. Yeah. All right. So, um, as, as Scott was saying, uh, last year was the inaugural year of our River Patrol program, um, South Platte Ranger District. And this slideshow is something that was actually put together by our two, two temporary employees that we hired last summer um, to um, patrol the river. Their names are Alice Higginbotham and Michael Martinka. And they did a really great job um, both uh, performing their duties on the river and putting together this, this slideshow I'm about to show you guys. See if I can get that. Okay, there it goes. Uh, so, um, yeah, 2020, everybody here <laughs> recalls um, the rather stunning uptick in recreation use that we experienced along the South Platte, Platte River. But it's actually also a problem. It, what happened was it exa exacerbated a, a problem that was already simmering um, from years past. Um, we have long been aware of a slow increase in resource damage and accumulation of trash and litter and um, user conflicts on the South Platte River. Um, but just last year, 2020, when COVID hit in the spring, and as soon as it was nice enough for people to be outside um, on the river, it was just like the floodgates cracked open. And um, we were all asking each other, what are we going to do about this situation? Because it was not, not acceptable. Um, so with encouragement actually from uh, several members of TU um, and our um, fishing guides, um, I ended up talking to our recreation staff officer, Lisa Hagley, uh, and our district ranger, Brian Banks. I think most of you folks maybe have uh, met or talked with Brian before. 
Um, and we came up with an idea for using our emergency hiring authority to dedicate a couple of temporary river patrollers to help us manage the situation on the South Platte. Since our appropriated budget from Congress did not include funding for such a program, we decided to apply for a grant from the South Platte, South Platte Enhancement Board or otherwise called SPEB. And SPEB was really glad to grant us the funding. Um, they had also been getting input and, and observing the changes on the river last year themselves. So they were really eager to help us out with this new idea. And that enabled us to bring on Alice and Michael in the middle of the summer. And because they were emergency hires, their terms were limited to a total of 60 calendar days each. But honestly, in those two months, uh, Michael and Alice made a huge amount of difference on the river. So our intent ultimately in 2020 was to fund this as a pilot with the idea of building a more perennial program on the river um, using a similar model to the OHV crew that we have had up on the Rampart Range for many years. And I wanna say we've intentionally labeled this as a river patrol program rather than a river ranger program, just to avoid any confusion about the, the duties of the patrollers. Um, they don't float the river like the river rangers that most of you might be familiar with on big rivers like the Gunnison or the Colorado. Our patrollers are 100% land-based and they function more like park rangers and maintenance crews. And this is due to the nature of the recreation use in our focal area, which is on the main stem in the South Platte River, starting up at Cheeseman Canyon, all the way down to the confluence, and then up the North Fork to Buffalo Creek. Our patrollers work from Monday through, excuse me, they work from Friday through Monday um, so that they are on hand during our busiest days in the weekend. And they're there to offer information, uh, to pick up litter, perform minor maintenance tasks, and generally provide kind of that, that sense of agency presence that really elevates the visitor experience in the front country. And then they also document their daily observations and interactions with the public so that we can monitor and then improve our management on the river. Our number one top priority for this program is visitor education and outreach. We want our river patrollers to be a friendly face wearing a US Forest Service uniform, but also keeping an eye on the land and the river and the visitors. They have time to stop and an answer questions. They know what kind of situations to look out for and how to respond to them. They also provide daily updates to the rest of us district managers about what's going on with the visitor experience and the resource, resource conditions from a day-to-day -day, um, perspective. And it's important to note here that our river patrollers are not law enforcement officers, although they do have radio connection to call, to call for law enforcement if it is needed. The same for emergency emergency um, response teams. The second priority is litter control. And uh, most of you probably know that the Forest Service actually has a really strict policy of pack it in, pack it out when it, when it comes to trash service. We don't provide dumpsters anywhere on the river outside of campgrounds. However, there is always inevitably the problem of both intentional and unintentional litter, which degrades the environment and the visitor experience for everybody. And we gave Alice and Michael a whole bunch of bags and some trash grabbers, and the two of them were total superheroes removing almost 3,000 gallons of trash from the river corridor.
Then the quality of a visitor's experience is also related to the condition of the facilities. So our river patrollers would um, take care of really minor maintenance issues themselves, or if there was something they noticed that was a much bigger issue, they'd bring that to the attention of our recreation staff so that we could get the, the proper fix applied. Uh, we do have a completely separate contract for toilet pumping and cleaning. Um, but the river patrollers would just help us keep an eye on the toilets to be sure that they were stocked and regularly cared for. And here's a little bit of the met metrics that we they were able to collect in just those um, actually less than 60 days because it was 60 calendar days um, minus weekends or their weekends, their days off. And in less than 60, 60 days, our two river patrollers put in more than 2,200 miles of coverage on the river. And they helped us reduce problems with trash, parking, campfires, and um, signage damage. And what's not included in this chart is the scores and probably even hundreds of visitors that they talk to, making all these people feel welcome and also making sure that they felt responsible and more aware of their surroundings in this beautiful river corridor that they're visiting. So our plans for 2021 are to continue the program, this time with two temporary employees starting in May and going through September. And we would like for one of them to be a certified forest protection officer who would have the skills and authorization to issue a violation notice if a particular situation calls for it. We're also in the process of forming a temporary agreement with Denver Water to share the cost of the program and allow Forest Service employees to patrol on the Denver Water parcels in cooperation with their staff. And then at last month's Fed meeting, um, we did talk with the Dillon Ranger District Recreation Program Manager on the White River National Forest. And we, we wanted to learn from them about the, some of the various agreements that they have in place up there in Summit County to help uh, uh, them fund crews on the Blue River and the Green Mountain Reservoir. Their situation is a little different than ours, uh, but they do use funding specifically from Summit County. Summit County actually voted for themselves to have a tax. Um, I think it's a, a sales tax that goes into a fund that the county manages and then um, will uh, give some of that money to the Forest Service to, um, to hire, to pay the salaries for um, Forest Service crews to clean up trash and, and take care of all the same issues that we have down here on South Platte. They also have a partnership with the Colorado Springs Utilities to support their watershed protection efforts. And that includes fire prevention and erosion repair, and of course, litter control. So Brian and Lisa and I were really inspired by the success up at the Dillon Ranger District. And we think that it is possible to create something of our own support system like that down here um, on the South Platte with our River Patrol program using our local partners and hopefully maintaining this momentum into the future. So with that, I'll actually wrap it up and encourage all of you to stay engaged uh, in our management efforts on the South Platte. And personally, and from the district office as well, from the bottom of our hearts, we thank you for all of the support that this chapter, chapter has given us over the years. We truly, truly appreciate it. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Michael? Yeah. Nate had a question asking, sure. um, has there been any discussion about documenting catch rates or data to include species and approximate size during the engagement of your people with the visitors? Uh, um, you mean of what people are catching? I assume so. Um, no, that's kind of a creel count sort of thing. 
Yeah, that that would be more of a CPW. Um, that that would be more in their their realm of responsibility, um, since they manage the actual fish in the fishery. Um, Forest Service, it, our the extent of our responsibility has more to do with the the habitat um, and and issues that affect water quality, and and not so much the the actual like populations of the animals themselves. Right, CPW takes care of the fish and you take care of the environment. Yes. Yeah, I will add one more thing. I am I was really excited to hear you guys have the, um, the cleanup day scheduled in July. Um, every little bit helps, but this year I really, really hope <laughs> that we won't be leaving so much for you guys to, to pick up because I know in the past our, our visitors and especially our, our guides um, end up cleaning a lot of trash on their own just because they're out there every day. And um, with our two folks dedicated to the river this summer, um, we're hoping to put a, a bigger dent in that. Yeah, we're have, hoping to have a very light day, but uh, we picked that day just because it was following the 4th of July weekend. And so thought- Very that, wise. Uh, yeah, it would be- uh... Very wise, thank you. Michael, I've got a question for you. Yeah, George. What fraction of the time would you estimate that your people are spending on being on the ground in the canyon, which is accessed by the Gill Trail, as opposed to being elsewhere within this corridor that you're operating in. So what fraction of the time is spent in the canyon itself? Um, quite a bit less than the rest of the river corridor. Um, I, I wouldn't even dare to hazard a, a number because it would be completely made up. Um, but it, even, even though Cheeseman Canyon itself does, does get a fair amount of pressure, the fact that you have to walk there um, filters out quite a bit of impact. Whereas all of the sites along the river that you can drive within 50 yards of the river's edge um, gets, gets a lot more pressure and the type of damage that's going on is quite a bit more severe um, in some respects than, than what's happening in Cheeseman Canyon. That said, I will say we are very aware of um, not only the, you know, the poop bags that have been building up and the, the issue with people having their dogs off leash and that sort of thing in the canyon, but also the trail itself um, starting to really degrade just, just as a matter of heavy use on really um, erosive soils on a, in a steep slope. And so we're in the process of trying to figure out how we're going to tackle that particular issue of trail sustainability within Cheeseman Canyon. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I have a question. Uh, if we had uh, oh, more patrollers in the canyon, or you know, somehow, do you think it would impress, uh, improve the uh, situation with the trash in there? I mean, uh, anybody picking up trash anywhere along any trail is always a good thing. Um, I mean, we, we, it'll, it'll only be two people. Um, mm -hmm. And they, this year they will be be on duty starting in May, whereas last year we weren't able to bring them on until August. Um, so by getting an earlier start on it, hopefully we'll be able to get a little bit ahead of the game earlier in the summer. Um, but, but yeah, every little bit helps. 
Michael, were the, will this uh, crew be working Friday through, did you say it was Monday or just the weekend? Yeah, generally they'll be working 10 hour days from Friday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Okay. Any other questions for Mike? What? I, I didn't. George, did you get all the chat? Uh, yeah. Yes, I think so. Okay, very good. All right, and Michael, I, well, thank you so much. Sure. I'll just say one more thing. Um, we are planning on applying for a second SPEB grant here next month. So that's that's our plan for rounding out the, the funding this year. But we're, we're definitely going to have to come up with something a little bit more um, long-term reliable. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening. You're welcome to continue to listen in, or you're uh, you can leave at any time you want. And Michael, oh, a bunch you. of people are are jumping in on the chat to say thank you. So thank you very much for being with us tonight. Yeah, of course. And I'm always here. You guys know how to get a hold of me on email if you have any other questions or ideas that come up later. Um, or suggestions for projects for us to work on this summer. Those are always welcome. We really appreciate okay. that. So I will hang around and, and uh, enjoy the next talk. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. Okay, our uh, next presenter uh, came to the rescue. And uh, I'll let uh, Brian Young uh, make the introductions. Okay. Thanks, Scott. Um, originally, uh, folks probably saw that we were going to be having uh, Joe. Joe. Uh, Joe was going to be presenting from the uh, the Blue Quill on uh, South Park Stillwater Fishing. But if you guys don't know Joe Schaefer, his real job is he's actually a Denver sheriff, and so he sends his deepest apologies. But as you can kind of uh, tell in these unsettled times, the Denver sheriff's job actually changes quite a bit on a day to day basis. So his schedule changed, and we had a big issue with that, unfortunately. So he sends his apologies, but uh, we've got a great. Uh, Great replacement speaker and a very close friend of mine, Chris Berry. Uh, if you don't know Chris, uh, Chris has been a great friend of the chapter. He's been uh, he's been an Orvis uh, store manager at uh, at both the Park Meadow store and the Cherry Creek store. He was a store manager for Gander Mountain. Uh, he was a guide for trout fly fishing for a bunch of years in the canyon and uh, in Deckers, and so he knows that water better than anybody. But he's also an amazing warm water fisherman. And we have a lot of warm water, uh, different uh, places around within 10, 15 minutes often of, uh, of the store and of, of where you probably live that just get really undersung and underutilized. And so what he's going to be talking about tonight is one of his big passions, which is warm water fishing in the in kind of the local area right next door. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Chris Berry. How you doing, guys? Let me just switch my screen over here. Sure. Give me two seconds. Yeah. First timer here. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay. We can hear you and we can see your uh, PowerPoint. Everything's looking good on this end, Chris. Okay. So you guys are seeing that? Okay. Thanks, George. Hold on one sec. Let me just get my cursor over so I can control the screen here. All right, cool guys. Yeah, thank you, Brian, for the introduction. Thank you guys for having me here. Uh, basically, Brian hit right on the head. I'm just kind of a fishing addict that lives down here in Parker. I've got a wonderful six-year-old daughter uh, who spent a lot of time with me. So in my world, we did a lot of two hours fishing here and there, one hour here and there. So what that allowed me to do is really explore all these ponds where I live uh, down in the South Metro area. So it's been a hoot. Um, and it's so close and it's so open for everyone uh, that Brian and I some years ago talked about making a little presentation on it. So that's what we're going to cover tonight, guys. Uh, it's just some great ideas close to home. You know, we all love to chase trout, but if you don't have the time, you know, just pop into one of these local options. So a lot of people come in and just say, hey, where do I start? What do I do? And that's the whole point of what we're going to do tonight, guys. So 
we've got a gorgeous picture to kind of lead in um, the agenda. Basically, the main species we're going to talk about, the main fish you're going to catch, are going to be panfish, smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, and some carp. So those are the four kind of what we call warm water species fish uh, that you'll be encountering as you're kind of cruising around uh, southern metro out here. So and we'll break each of these down specifically uh, as we go along for the next few minutes here. So basically, we're going to look at local hotspots. Um, Brian's a big fan of saying that no one in our shop you know, has secret spots, and we don't. So please, go use everything I'm talking to you about tonight. I want you to get out there and fish. I want you to catch some fish. So we're going to talk about some hot spots. We're going to talk about flies and then tips and techniques. And then more importantly, the timing. Uh, basically, yeah, we had 18 degrees last night. So just keep in mind uh, what we're talking about tonight. Let's give it a month, month and a half before it gets rocking and rolling. Um, but we'll talk about timing more here in a minute. Uh, but yeah, the warm water fishing uh, coincides with our runoff. So we have a great opportunity when the rivers are blown out uh, to do some local still water fishing. So let's go right into panfish. So basically on this picture here that you guys are seeing, uh, it's just a brief outline for folks that may not know what some of these species are. So we have the variety of species from the bluegill to the sunfish to the crappie, green sunfish, pumpkin seed, and then yellow perch. So we included that guy. So basically, these are the main species that we kind of go after um, on an easier level for fishing. So if you're getting into the sport or if you have a kiddo like me, uh, pan fishing is a great way to hone your technique and to usually hopefully get some kind of quick and fun action. So everyone on this group, if you've fished before, you've caught a pan fish, you remember how much fun it is. So I encourage you, if you're new to the sport, I heard a couple of names earlier, please take to heart some of these spots and go catch some sunnies on the fly. Everyone loves getting some action, but this is just a quick outline of the species you may encounter. So let's talk very specifically about spots. Does you no good if you don't know where to go? And I have maps of these uh, locations that I'm talking about right now. So for you on kind of the southwest corner over by Chatfield State Park, uh, one of my favorites is an area called Trailmark Park. It's also known as Fairview Reservoir. It's just west of Chatfield there in a little subdivision. And we'll get more in depth about each one of these spots. The other place I go, because I'm over in Parker, is a lake called the Pinery, also known as Bingham Lake. Uh, very easy. Again, it's right in the subdivision, great access, uh, just a close area for me and Parker. Over around the tech center is the Flying Bee Park. This is one of Brian's favorite areas here over in Highlands Ranch. It's just south of 470. Very quaint little park, and we'll show you a map here in a sec. And then even more quaint and small and easy to navigate is the C-470 pond, which is just north of C-470 around Colorado and County line. It's located right next to a Copper Canyon Apartments. Uh, it's a great, great spot, chock full of little fish. So these are four spots that we're gonna take a look at here in a little more detail. The Trailmark Park is the first one. It's west of Chatfield and you can see there it's got a little island in the middle. There's a very nice um, parking area and restroom over on this northwest corner. And there's a trail that goes all the way around. So it's great access for maybe someone like a kiddo who doesn't really need the bushwhack or someone who just wants to ride a bike around. Very, very easy access. Pretty much everywhere on these little lakes, you're going to find fish. And we'll talk more about finding structure here in a second. So there's real no secret spots on these little lakes is once you get there, you start kind of doing your deductive reasoning in your own mind. But these overviews give you kind of a lay of the land. That's why I feel that they're important in these slideshows. Uh, Pinery Lake is over in Parker. What you really kind of hard to see here is basically the whole west side is a rock dam face. So those sunfish that we're talking about, these panfish, love to hide in the nooks and crannies, the crevasses on the west side of the lake. So to give you a specific area for the pinery, 
when you get to the parking area right up here by the little symbol, you'll see this whole rock face. So very great place to fish for the sunnies is off the dam into those rocks. Flying Bee Park, again, very, very small. You can walk around the whole thing in about a minute and a half if you were jogging. Um, so very easy to determine where those fish are gonna be. There's no hiding hole for them. So it's very easy to deduce where you need to fish. And then the C470 pond's even easier. You can see on the left side of the screen, here's the um, Canyon Apartments. And on the back corner over here is a easement through the gate. And you can see that trail that goes all the way over to this tiny little pond. Even easier to deduce where the fish are gonna be on this little lake. So Flying Bee and C470, very quick and easy to figure out where those fish are gonna be hiding out. So basically flies for catching panfish. We don't need to really overthink this too much. You're just out there, kind of have some fun and keep it simple with sunfish, which is great. That's the whole point. So as you see in my key flies here, you see my Amy's aunt. So this one here is a grasshopper rendition, and then it's gonna be the dry fly. And then what you're gonna see down below are three other nymph imitations. So what we're gonna do is what we call the dry dropper. So what I want you to look at is the sizing, 18, 18, 18. Main takeaway is you gotta think of these fish, they have little, little mouths, little bodies. You don't wanna throw a huge fly that they can't eat. So I like to use smaller flies uh, just to give me a better opportunity of hooking these fish and not have them kind of peck at it and push it out of the way. So techniques for these guys, how to fish for them. Dry dropper, like I was just saying. So what I'll do is I'll tie on that foam grasshopper. That'll be my indicator, my bobber. Then about three feet down, I usually run 4X, and then I will put my more realistic nymph offering. And don't get overly creative with the nymphs. Use up whatever fly you wanna get rid of out of your box. They're not really too picky about it. As long as the size is 16 or 18, you're gonna be spot on for what these fish want. So very simple, dry fly to a dropper. If you're just getting into it, easiest way to go fish these little lakes. Movement, so hopper fishing, especially for pan fish is a lot of fun. You throw your hopper out there. Once that fly hits the water, you're gonna see those rings dispel a lot of movement like a struggling little grasshopper. That's what you want. So after I cast my flies out, I let them sit five, 10 seconds, those rings will stop and then I'll slowly give it another strip, causing those commotion motion again. So I want those rings to reappear like a struggling grasshopper or cricket. And then it's also making my nymph go up and down. So when you get a strike, hopefully they'll eat that dry fly or they'll eat your nymph and you'll watch that, uh, you'll watch that grasshopper go down like a bobber. So very easy way to learn how to nymph fish in that regard, dry dropper fishing. Uh, and well, they just love to see flies moving. Just keep it moving is the takeaway. When I'm fishing these little lakes too, horizontal casting to the bank. I'm not trying to wing my fly 40, 50 feet out there. These fish are very shallow. They're in the warmer water where insects are more active, the water's warmer, and hence that's where the fish are gonna be. So don't worry if you can't cast 50, 60 feet. That's not what it's about. As long as you can cast, hopefully kind of parallel to the shoreline, 10, 15 feet out, that's where the majority of these fish are gonna be. So when I get to these little lakes, I try to find a spot where I can get my cast almost sideways and look for that five, six, 10 feet offshore and or closer. And that's where you're gonna find these tan fish. So when I get to these lakes, first thing I do is I look for structure. I look for cattails logs, rocks, dam faces, anything that's going to have a hidey hole for them. All these fish want to do are eat and not get eaten. So they need a place to hide from bass and other bigger species that are going to be around looking to make a munch out of them. So look for anything of distinction. Um, it's very easy to see a log or cattails, and those are great hidey holes for panfish. Uh, don't leave fish to find fish. So they're school fish. Meaning if you find one, there's gonna be more around. There's safety in numbers for panfish. 
So if you're not finding any hits, nothing going on, keep moving until you do find them and then really hunker down and uh, try to weed through maybe 10, 15 of them. Don't worry about um, um, over abusing them. They're just gonna keep coming in sets hopefully. But if you're not getting hit, don't wish and pray that the hatch is gonna come on. You're, you're just looking to get aggressive fish. So keep moving till you find them. Then panfish, uh, great time coming up. May and June are their spawning time where they're gonna come in shallow. Uh, what they'll do is make little beds, cleared areas of sand called reds, and then you can see them, uh, and they're very, very shallow, up to you know a foot, maybe even less. So you can identify quickly where they're going to be. They do that mid to June, and then after the spawn, they move out just a wee bit deeper for safety from predators. But again, most of these fish are going to be in the shallower water where the water's warmer, within 10, 12 feet of the shoreline. July through September is going to be ideal. The water is going to be at its warmest. Uh, it's going to be shallow fishing situations. If it's a cold, breezy morning, you know, don't run out there for panfish. It's really an afternoon game where that hot, breezy afternoon after the water and insects have warmed up, that's when your pan fishing is really going to be the best. So try to pick a warmer day. Don't run out there at six in the morning and expect a whole lot going on with the panfish. So here's some very nice pictures. Uh, some of these folks might be in the group right now, actually, I see Cindy right there. Uh, so again, you can see just a lot of smiling faces on these little guys, just a lot of fun, great way to learn how to fish. Smallmouth bass is a passion of mine. They're the next, uh, next category we're gonna talk about. Pound for pound, I think smallmouth are the best fighting fish in freshwater that we have. If you've ever caught one, you'd know they're dogged, determined fish. They just do not give up. You know, a 12 inch smallmouth bass makes it feel like it's an 18 inch trout. I'm not, not exaggerating. So smallmouth bass are called red eyes. If you look at the eye right there, they have that red portion. And then their lower jaw does not extend past their eye, hence why they're called smallmouth. And then down below are a picture of a, a male and a female. Um, not really too, too important to distinct between the two. Uh, but if you wanna know, hey, did I catch a large mouth or a small mouth? Look at the jaw. If it goes past the eye, then you call a large mouth. If it stops at the eye, then you call a small mouth. So my favorite spots for smallies, red eyes, small mouth, whatever you like to call them. A uh, big old secret little lake called Chatfield State Park. Now keep that one under your hat. It's a pretty big secret. Just kidding. So Chatfield's awesome for smallies, and we'll look at a lake map here in a second. Uh, South Platte Park Ponds, just north of 470, as you go past uh, the river, South Platte, you have those ponds there, smallies living in there. And then my two favorite over by my way a little more is Quincy Reservoir and Aurora Reservoir. So they're on the east side of town, uh, but well worth the drive to get over there, to say the least. So Chatfield is designed for smallmouth, and here's why. Smallmouth love rocks, they can't get enough. So when you're smallmouth fishing, you need to find rock or hard bottom to figure out where they are. That's the structure they like. So the whole North Dam of Chatfield is nothing but loose rock. Habitat for crawfish, habitat for smallmouth. Easy to find them by walking the dam, and then that uh, northwest corner is also rock. This is the marina area they just redid, the boat launch. And this corner here is nothing but loose rock. Again, plenty of hidey holes for juvenile fish, plenty of hidey holes for crayfish. So very easy on Chatfield. I go to the northwest corner, I walk the dam, or I simply fish the bump out by the marina, or I'm sorry, by the boat ramp there. Very easy for smallmouth. So South Platte Park Ponds, the ones north of 470 there, um, you have the Eagle Watch Lake and then Red Tail Lake. Both of these lakes are pretty big, um, but I like to fish the north side of both. If you look at Red Tail, the river actually, drain, well, actually drains out of the lake into the river. Um, so I like this last bay over here where it drains into the South Platte River. And then over at 
uh, Eagle Watch, this back corner here has some loose rock and there's also a lot of forage. There's a lot of perch back here. Uh, this is my kind of favorite area for the smallmouth. And then right before the two named ones is kind of an unnamed one. It's right off the parking lot. And this, I have seen the state record smallmouth in there. Uh, it's gin clear, it's a tiny little pond, uh, but there are smallmouth right in that little unnamed uh, overflow pond too. So three great spots plus the river all in one. Great spot to go look for smallmouth too. Quincy, boom, classic smallie, uh, smallie habitat. Rock dam again, guys. The whole northwest corner right there, nothing but loose piled rock. This is where I go and look for uh, my smallmouth. Anywhere, you don't even need to put on waders. You just cast along this. There's a nice depression where the water drops and you get this gorgeous rock face all the way across of loose scramble for them. Just a fantastic smallmouth habitat. And we'll talk more about Aurora when we talk about uh, some largemouth too and the habitat kind of changes for them. But Quincy, easy, no brainer. All the way along that rock dam face, absolutely fantastic. And then Aurora Reservoir, no loose rock, so to speak, but the whole west side of the reservoir here is concrete dam face. So the biggest smallies I've personally caught have been off the west side of Aurora Reservoir, just standing on the dam with dry feet in May, looking for these fish that come in shallow to spawn. So the whole west side of the Aurora Reservoir dam uh, has silt, sand up to hard bottom, emulating those rocks, just rock star. And then there is a tiny little patch over here by the swim beach on the west side again, that is aligned with rocks. And if the flow, or not the flow, if the fill levels up enough, this bay will be submerged with water and then also submerged with this loose cobble. So, and it is right now, it was over there this morning. So there's some nice loose rock here, the smallies will get on. And then this whole west side here at Aurora, the smallies will get on. So very easy to determine where they're gonna be. So key flies for smallmouth, uh, damselflies, huge importance for all species of bass, be it smallmouth or largemouth. I'll talk more about those in a second. And then up here on the top right, the mini cruiser gray white number six, that's a shad imitation. These reservoirs grow these big bass because of the shad food base. So these big bass rely on and need uh, these shad forage fish. And this mini cruiser is a great easy casting fly that emulates that shad perfectly. And then every small mouth and large mouth love leeches. So I'll fish a smaller size 12 leech, or sometimes I'll fish a slump buster, which is maybe a big leech or perhaps a crawfish imitation. So I've got my bases covered with my bait fish and my leeches and then my damsels. The biggest fish I've catch smallmouth wise have been on the damsel fly. And I'll talk about these. So if I get up to the lake and I'm wondering what to fish first for smallmouth, first thing I'm gonna usually do is throw streamers. I'm gonna pick that white mini cruiser and I'm gonna cast that guy out, let him sink and then retrieve him along the rock faces. So if you have a sinking line, great. If you don't, that's fine too. You can do it with a floating line. Um, you just have to maybe weight that fly a little bit to help it get down. Uh, but I do like to fish a sinking line for um, uh, a lot of my lake fishing. If you really get into it, that's a discussion for another time, but a sinking line is gonna help you immensely. But let's keep it easy. Let's just talk about kind of floating lines right now. So I throw a single or double streamer, depending on your casting uh, style or what the wind's doing. What I do again is I cast horizontal to that riprap rock face. I will cast that rock, uh, cast along that rock face, let those flies sink, retrieve that horizontal or parallel to that rock face. I want that fly to sit in that strike zone as long as I can. If I was just to bomb it out as far as I can away from me and bring it in, I'm only going through a couple of feet of a, a strike zone. I want to be able to keep that fly in that strike zone of four or five feet deep off the rocks the whole time. So keeps my fly in the spot a lot better by going ahead 
and cast in parallel uh, horizontal to the structure. So streamer's pretty easy on that accord. My favorite way to fish that damselfly and leech is hanging them under an indicator, just like I'm trout fishing for uh, a roar reservoir or spinning mountain reservoir. I'm gonna have an indicator. I'm gonna have my damselfly and I'm gonna have my leech hanging maybe five, six feet below, um, below my indicator, letting it lap with the breeze. So basically the wind's going to bob your indicator up and down. Those flies are going to give this undulation and these fish are going to just hoover uh, flies on warm, windy days right off these riprap rocks where everything gets churned up. These fish just go into a little feeding frenzy in these mud lines where the wind just howls and scours everything into a concise spot off these rock faces. So my absolute favorite way is fish in smallmouth under an indicator on warm, windy afternoons in the summer. You just can't beat it. So don't worry about flies too much. You know, it's going to be a leech. It's going to be a damselfly. Uh, if they're around, a hare's ear is another great choice too for putting under your indicator. As long as that wind's blowing and everything's lapping up into those rocks, they're not going to they're not going to be too picky about it. They're going to be pretty easy to catch. So when I get to the lake, uh, we talked about finding rocks for the smallies, but I also look for other structure of typical bass, cattails, logs, rocks, like we were talking about dam faces. You really won't find them in open water if you're just blind casting for the most part. So you want to find that structure. You want to find something that's going to hold them to a certain spot. Bass don't cruise around like trout will. They don't make laps. They have their kind of house and that's where they like to hang out and reside. So once you find that structure, that house for them, uh, really ups your game rather than just kind of blind cast in a way. And they're not, uh, they're, they're not school oriented like uh, panfish are. So you have one nice one, maybe two nice one in an area that's their home that's their food base and then you, once you get one or two you move 10 20 feet kind of space yourself out again you're not going to find a big group of them like sunfish so once i get one or two nice ones i move along knowing i kind of weeded out the best fish that are going to be around they're really kind of solitary fish and if you're not finding fish keep moving it's the same thing like I was saying with panfish. You're not waiting for this miracle hatch to happen. You got to go find those eager fish. So don't just wait and pray for the calabatus or a midge hatch to occur. It's not going to make a hoot of difference. Just go and find those fish that want to eat uh, just by putting in some footwork. It helps immensely. So springtime's coming up. Um, May and June for those big spawning smallmouth. I'm shaking my head because that is the only thing I do. You will see me camped out on Aurora Reservoir on that west side of the dam. It's because it's 15 minutes from my house. May through June, those big fish come in on all these lakes to spawn. Uh, it's great to sight fish them. You can see them in and around uh, the cleared off beds, the sandy area, uh, and really have fun just kind of sight fishing some of these big fish or, you know, next to some of these beds if you want to let them spawn which is encouraged there's going to be someone past them or around them uh, that's waiting to uh waiting to have a turn on that too so best thing for remembering time wise may through october uh smallies do remain active when it is a little bit colder out uh largemouth kind of slow down come september october when the water cools but uh Smallies do much better with cold water. So our season, they've really put on a big glut in October uh, for fattening up for winter. So don't put away the bass idea in October this year. Go for some more, some smallies again, for sure. They're very light sensitive. So bright, sunny conditions, no wind, very tough for smallmouth fishing. You want that windy day with the overcast, uh, clouds that chop on the water. Uh, that's what you want. They're very, very sensitive to light. So if it's a bluebird sunny day, they're really going to scoot out into some deeper water for, um, uh, for cover. So if you walk up to the lake and it's a, you know, like glass, meaning there's no chop, uh, you're probably going to struggle. But those afternoons when it's nice and warm and windy, then it's going to be game on for you. 
So I encourage you to feel the fight of a smallie. Once you, <laughs> once you get a small mouth, you're gonna be pretty addicted to it for sure. So here's some pictures of smallies. Um, just some nice, you know, I think the state record's like six pounds. Uh, most of them are really 12 to 16 inches. That gets you excited. Couple pushing 18 or 20 inches over at uh, Quincy and Aurora. Uh, but just hard fighting fish. I encourage you to go find them. They're, they're quite fun. So they're, they're brethren here, largemouth bass. So you know you have a largemouth bass when the jaw extends past the eye. Then you know you have uh, the largemouth. So the biggest difference between the two is the way they eat. So smallmouth have kind of a trout mouth. They will cruise through, they will take something that's moving, they will eat kind of like a trout will. Whereas bass, largemouth, they call them bucket mouths for a reason. When they're gonna eat something, they open that big bucket mouth and they inhale it. So they don't really chase it down and attack it while it's moving. They really do a good job of waiting for that fly or natural to slow down and then they really inhale it and suck it up into their bucket mouth. So when we talk about tactics here in a second, uh, it's a little bit different than pulling streamers for mollies. So let's talk first about some spots to get back to for the large mouths. So trail mark again, that came up. And what you're gonna see too guys is a lot of these fish show up in multiple places. So they'll have largemouth bass, they'll have panfish, they'll have carp. So a lot of these places you'll hear over and over, that's because there's multiple species. And I encourage you to go check them out because there's a lot of offerings. So Trailmark Park, that Fairview Reservoir again, just on the west side of Wadsworth, has some uh, a lot of smaller largemouth bass. Over by me again in Parker is the Salisbury Equestrian Park. It's just a, a sports complex ball fields over in Parker that has wonderful big bass and carp. That's all that's in there are big bass and big carp. So if you really wanna go for some trophy bass, um, Salisbury is a great spot over by my place in Parker. Quincy uh, has wonderfully big uh, largemouth bass. And basically what happens is the state stocks rainbow trout in the Quincy, which is awesome. But those huge largemouth bass have determined they can eat one of those stock trout in one bite. So now you have eight, nine, 10 pound bass, uh, mongoloid bass, because they're eating stock trout the state puts in. So if you're really looking for a trophy, Quincy's where it's at. Pinery over in Parker again, great for smaller bass, uh, easy access. And then another great spot, for easy access and small bass is the Spring Gulch Pond. And that's over in Highlands Ranch. Uh, it's a little bit of a walk. It's not even 15 minute walk from the trailhead to get over there. Uh, but that Spring Gulch Pond can be a lot of fun for both uh, bass and panfish. Let's take a quick look at the, the map again. Trail Mark Park, we talked about that for the sunnies. Same thing for the bass. You can walk the whole trail edge here. You just kind of keep your uh, keep your distance back a little bit and kind of sight fish those those fish in the, the May-June time. They'll come up very shallow, uh, trying to eat some of the spawning uh, sunfish uh, and other, uh, other species that are in there. So they're pretty darn fun to go and kind of sight fish um, and lots of them. There's quite a few over the years now. So keep trail mark in your mind. Salisbury. Um, basically, this is just a water retention ditch pond over in Parker. It's just recycled uh, clean water. Uh, if you see up here on the northwest corner, you can see this pump house. Basically, the water flows out of here after it's been treated. And this whole kind of northwest corner is where I search for uh, the largemouth bass. There's a bit of a steeper drop off here, and it's just a sand bottom. So it's very easy to just head to this northwest corner and go explore around the pump house here. Um, we'll talk more about it later when we talk about carp as well. But you can park right on the southwest corner, walk up the service road, and this whole northwest corner is what I want you to remember. Quincy. So we talked about Quincy for the smallmouth, and I was 
pretty adamant about you guys finding the rocks, the riprap. And you'll find some largemouth on there as well, which is great. But in May and June, what I do is I sneak back to this East Bay over here. What happens is those bigger fish will pull into this warmer, uh, warmer, shallower water, uh, and there's more structure over here. There's some old fallen trees. There's some floating debris and cattails. Those bigger, uh, bigger bass will come into this eastern bay back here, and that's where I do a lot of my fishing uh, for the largemouth. Um, you can walk all the way around Quincy as well and pick up bass off the points off the island over here, uh, but it turns into quite a, quite a walk. So I really like this uh, East Bay. Uh, there's a trail that leads you right there, and that's a great spot for the largemouth, as well as the first corner here with the dam for the largemouth, for sure. And then Pinery Lake. We talked about the rock dam face for um, the panfish. There's no smallmouth in here, um, but Bass also will hang out on that rock face. And then more importantly, if you go over the pinery, there's a, a bay back here, right? So it's nice and shallow, it's wooded. There's some fallen trees. There's some old uh, poles, uh, dock poles that are cemented in the ground back there. So that back corner and then the dam face is where I like to go for the largemouth over at pinery. And they're not, not huge, but they're, uh, they're numerous over there, which is fun. And then lastly, that spring gulch pond, very, very small. Uh, basically, there's two docks that come out, two fishing piers that go out into the lake. And it's very, very shallow, very, very weedy, uh, but it can be a lot of fun uh, for those largemouth bass that are in there. Uh, and it's a special regulation lake where it's artificials only, catch and release only. So it's a good lake for um, uh, seeing the growth of catch and release, which is great to see in, in warm water fishing. So key flies that we like to throw for bass, crayfish, crayfish, crayfish. They love crayfish, largemouth, can't get enough of them. And they also like baitfish. So back to that shad pattern, that mini cruiser we were throwing earlier for the smallmouth. I also spend a lot of time throwing that for bass because it's a huge food protein source for the largemouth and the smallmouth. So a bait fish imitation like a mini cruiser or a Klaus or minnow must have, and then varying crayfish uh, flies. So I'll carry a size four, I'll carry a size six. And then if I think I'm gonna be over it someplace with smaller fish, maybe 10, 13 inch bass, I'll start carrying like a size 10 or size eight, something even smaller so that those smaller fish are, get excited about the crayfish. So if a slew of crayfish imitations in three or four different sizes is what I'm getting at with, uh, with the largemouth. They're not very picky if you find them. So again, what do I do when I first step up to these lakes? I love to throw a crayfish to start for largemouth. For smallmouth, I like a bait fish. For largemouth, I love to start with a rusty colored crawfish. So if you have a sinking line, you can see that's in there, great. Um, not that important if you don't, you can do it with a weight forward floating line for sure. But what you want to do on these bigger flies and these bass is start fishing like 3x leader now. So you want something a lot thicker uh, and heavier than we're doing for the smallmouth and uh, the panfish for sure. So back to the idea of movement. So I've got this crawfish. I'm going to cast it again horizontal parallel to that rock dam face so that when that fly sinks and I retrieve it, it's going to come back in that strike zone. They're always going to be within that 10, 15 foot range of the dam for the most part. So I make that horizontal cast to the, to the, to the bank or the shore and I slowly retrieve this fly. With smallmouth, we kind of fish it fast like a, a streamer like you would for a trout. They're going to chase it. They're going to eat it. With the largemouth, like we were talking about, I want to retrieve kind of slowly and pause. 90% of the time when you get bit by a largemouth, it's when you start, you're regaining your strip after that pause, you're going to feel a tug on the end of the line. And back to that idea of the bucket mouth, they come down on their prey, they open that big mouth, 
and they engulf it. They literally inhale it. So we need that fly to pause so that fish has time to go down on it. And then when we feel that uh, tension as we re regain our stripping, you're gonna feel that tension and you set the hook. So very, very important to have that pause. You, you just cannot largemouth fish without having that pause. Um, also, bass fishing on top, right? This is a hot summer day. You want to have fun. Um, throw some top water. Throw some, you know, popping, popping flies. Um, the elite little, you know, tadpole imitation looking, the elite little frog imitations. Um, so there's a myriad of different size poppers, whatever you're comfortable casting, but they can be a lot of top water fun uh, come those late summer, July, August days, uh, right before dark, they really get territorial and predaceous uh, and they'll come and whack some top water, which is, which is just a blast. So a lot of fun about them is they do eat a lot of top water, which is great. So largemouth really uh, structure oriented, even more so perhaps than the smallmouth. So they're ambush predators, largemouth. They like to hide under logs, under rocks, uh, big rocks on dam faces. They'll hide in the roots of cattails and just wait for something to come by and then they'll ambush it and react and eat that prey. So when I'm largemouth fishing, I really want to find a sunken log that I just can't see over the end of. I want to find a, a weed edge that I just can't see where it kind of drops off to, a big boulder that I just can't see around. They're ambush predators. So think of a good ambush spot when you're looking for fishy, fishy places. Put yourself in that position. Hey, where would I hide if I'm going to ambush a little fish that's coming out? So very, very important to find some good structure. And once you have found a couple logs or big rocks, when you go back, it's going to be the same spot again. That's their house. They, you get, they get kind of territorial for real. So you'll kind of determine where these fish are, but find something unique. Um, and they're solitary fish more so than smallies as well. Find one, you get a nice 15, 16 incher. That's probably going to be the only one around. They're really uh, territorial to the point of they will run other fish out. So keep moving. You know, if you get one or two out of a spot, great. I mean, give it another five minutes, but don't say, hey, oh, I think I'm on the honey hole. This is going to be the next hour of my life. Now, nah, keep moving after you get one or two for sure. It'll get you, it'll get you more productivity. Springtime spawn, it's coming up. This is when the biggest bass get caught, May and June. They come in shallow to spawn. They're going to clear out some beds. And if they're spawning, go ahead and leave them alone. But you know, in that surrounding area, there's going to be someone who's not actively engaged that wants to eat. So I'll cast beyond the bed. I'll cast to the left of the beds, cast to the right, anywhere you just can't quite see what's going on after that little sandy cleared area, there's going to be someone hanging around in the springtime. Um, all winter, I'm sorry, all, all summer, um, it just gets better and better. So May, June are great. And then hotter the better. August, those dog days of August and September, best bass fishing. It's going to be weedy. It's going to be hot water. There's going to be bugs everywhere. The frogs are out. That's prime bass time. So again, try to keep that, uh, keep that mindset of shallow water. Uh, I can't stress enough how many times I've seen a log in like a foot of water at some of these lakes in the middle of summer. And I'm like, man, that just looks so good. It's only a foot deep. You make it cast into the shade of a, of a log and you get a bass. So fish very shallow. So fish shallow and then work your way out so you don't spook those fish when you get to the lakes. And then later in the season, May to September is ideal. And then later in the season, they'll move deeper and they really kind of are out of our reach come October, November and the bigger lakes. So it's really just a May through September, which is great. They're just like their uh, smallie cousins. They love um, choppy water. You got to have that churned up choppy water, especially when they're so shallow. So if they're only in a foot of water and it's a bluebird day, they're going to see you coming a mile away. So really, you know, you really got to have that windy chop, uh, that overcast day to, to uh, give you some camouflage. Um, and then don't run out there in the mornings, just like I said with, you know, the panfish. They don't need you know they don't need much to warm up 
But if you go out there at 6.30 in the morning, you know, let it warm up. Let those insects get going. Let the bait fish get moving for the day. So don't run out there too early. If you can, stay later into the evening. When that light changes and you get to dusk, that's prime time, um, big largemouth bass time. So do it after work, you know, get out there after that afternoon rainstorm, go hit it right before dark. That's certainly the best time. And then here's some nice pictures of some largemouth bass from the, from the area there. Uh, a lot of happy people. Yeah, they're just fun. And they got the big old mouths and they get very, very large. Uh, they're just, they're just a hoot to catch. I love them. Very acrobatic. When you catch them, they go straight up in the air. They do, uh, you know, they do their showboating for you. It's just wonderful. So that will bring us to the last species that you're really going to see inside of uh, these South Metro uh, impoundments, so to speak. Um, there's two kinds of carp that we're really going to see when we're out and about. So basically, the one on the left here is the common carp. And the one on the right here is what we call the grass carp. So the common carp is the carp that's kind of everywhere. Um, basically, they eat a little bit different. So if you look over here onto this carp, the common carp, uh, you can see their jowls, their mouth are actually kind of facing downward like a sucker. If you guys have ever caught a sucker fish, it, the, the jaws are coming off the bottom of the, uh, the mouth coming off the bottom of the jaw here. Common carp, are easier to catch because of that fact. They come down on a prey and they will suck it up and then you can feel that tension and react or you can visually see them eat that. Grass carp are a little bit different. They have a horizontal mouth uh, like a trout. So they're not really true bottom feeders in the sense of vacuuming things up. Uh, and grass carp kind of run into their prey uh, or they kind of nose down and come down on, on the vegetation. Grass carp are very, very tough. Basically, they're vegetarian for the most part. They will eat occasional um, leech or insect, but probably 90% of their diet is actual vegetation. It's hard for us as anglers to mimic vegetation very well. But luckily, the common carp has to eat uh, pretty readily. They're big fish. You've all seen probably pictures of them. Um, they have to eat, and they have to eat a lot. And the allure of carp fish in the past couple of years, everyone's figuring out these things are 10, 12, 20 pound fish. They fight like crazy and they're everywhere. They're in every little pond, ditch, river uh, that you can think of in town. So they've become very popular to go catch and for good reason. It's a lot of fun. And let's delve into some techniques for getting some, some carp. Last thing down on the bottom here is some koi. Um, I've been seeing more and more of just these ornamental Japanese, you know, carp from ponds showing up in some of our lakes. Um, can't say I've really caught them, uh, but people ask enough to just say those are just ornamentals that maybe some kid let go or not sure where they're coming from. There's quite a few of them around lately. I've not got one, but I'd like to. So uh, hot spots for carp. Uh, Salisbury Equestrian Park again. Uh, that place over in Parker I was talking to you about, the reclaimed water, we call it the mud pit. Centennial Park Lake over in Englewood uh, off Federal and Union, so not quite where we are, just northwest a little bit, but well worth the drive. Uh, Johnson Reservoir, Clement Park, that's right up the way, Wadsworth and Bowles. And then South Platte River, um, pretty much when I start fishing for carp in the river, I'll start, as it says here, uh, at Santa Fe Boulevard and Union, and then I'll work north uh, where the water gets a little bit warmer. Uh, it gets a little bit different topography. But we'll look at a map here right now, and we'll talk about these carp. So Salisbury, uh, no brainer. So we said the bass were up here by the pump house. The whole south end of this lake is nothing but grass carp, huge hundreds and hundreds of grass carp. You can walk out there, uh, you'll see them tailing, meaning, you know, tails are out of the water, they're feeding. You'll see mud going everywhere from groups of them scourging the bottom. You'll see mud flats. Um, best spot I can tell you if you want to go catch a grass carp with, without, without a hesitation is going to be the southwest corner of Salisbury Park. 
Absolutely incredible. You'll see me there a ton on the summer evenings after, after dinner. Can't stress that enough. Place is awesome. Centennial Park Lake. So this was up on Federal and Union there. Uh, here's the thing. You got three things going on up at Centennial. So you got the main lake, which is cool. You've got some flats over here, some shallower water where the carp like to hang out. There's an overflow lake over here on this northeast corner, which holds carp. And then you also just barely in the corner here, you can see the South Platte River. So I've got the river, I've got a very small pond, and then I've got a mid-sized city lake that all have carp. So if I'm going, if like, hey, I'm going to go fish for the day, I'm just going carp fishing, I'm not going for like an hour or two, I go up to Centennial because I can fish all three of this. And then once I hit the South Platte River, it's endless as to how far north you can go. And there's carp the whole way um, through the restructuring that's up there. So if you're looking to make a whole day of it, please go up to Centennial Park Lake. You have three options. And then close to home, Johnston Park or Johnston Reservoir, Clement Park. Um, you guys know that there's a little strip mall up here. Uh, there's an easy trail that goes all the way around it. It's probably right by all our houses. So this one doesn't get any closer. And what's great about this is these, this bike trail just makes a big loop and they move around a lot in this lake. So it's, I can't say this bay is better than that. You just gotta walk and look for them. And we'll talk about tactics here in a second. This is a great lake to just walk because a lot of it is open for casting. There's not a lot of uh, vegetation behind you. So very easy to walk around and cast uh, and not get caught up on uh, a lot of snags. And then the South Platte River, this is pretty much endless too. So I say, you know, from uh, Union going north is a good starting point and it's endless after that. You can go up to, I know guys that love to go up to 120th Avenue off I-25. I like to go up by 104th. So it's way, way difficult to try to break down, you know, 40 miles of carp water. Um, but just that being said, that Union is great. And then another great access everyone talks about is the Colfax, uh, Colfax Bridge, as we call it, off I-25 in Colfax. It's not pretty. We're not going to pretend, you know, this is the Decker South Platte River, uh, but there are really nice big fish there. And there's a lot of easy access through downtown Denver for these big carp that are down there. But if you're really interested in specific spots on the South Platte River, I encourage you to go to the website carpslam.org. So basically there's a carp uh, uh, environmental uh, contest every year, environmental challenge, you know, biggest fish, most fish, and then the proceeds go to Trout Unlimited and other uh, different organizations. Anyways, they have all the sections broken down, access points, where to park, where to access the river. So if you really wanna get carp, go for carpslam.org, great starting point for you, for access on the South Platte River. So key flies for carp, uh, crayfish, you're seeing a pattern here with crayfish. So your bass flies, they're not just a one-time use. They're gonna be great for fishing uh, carp as well. So I've got a near enough crawfish over here, size eight. Uh, I got a light little guy here, Jan's crawfish. And then I've got a Mike Gorgon craw, which is one of my favorites. And he's over here uh, and he's probably about a 12 or a 10, so a little bit smaller. So we'll talk about this heavy, light, medium selection uh, when we talk about flies here in a second. So when you first get up to a carp, uh, carp lake, carp pond, you're gonna see three kinds of carp doing their natural routine. You're gonna see feeding carp, and those are the ones you wanna see. Those are the carp that are nose down, actively feeding. Those are the fish that you want to encounter because they're gonna eat your fly. The cruising carp are the ones that are gonna go by in sets of four or five, and they're just making laps. They're just cruising around these lakes. You can take a couple of shots at them. Your odds are okay, but not great that they'll stop, come down on your fly, 
And then the last one is the sunning. They're useless. So they're just sitting there literally just soaking up the sun. You can look at them all day. They're not doing the damn thing. Keep moving. So you want to find those feeding fish or those cruising fish. Ideally, you got those feeding fish where they're nose down and you can see that tail working and they're, and they're on a trajectory. They're on a mission for a reason. So first thing you do is you observe. Stay out of the water. Look around. Look for these three behaviors in, in these carp. Find those feeding fish before you even get near the water's edge. They're going to hear you quite a ways away. So they're fun because it's all sight fishing, and it's a lot of fun because it's all stealth. So don't even get in the water. Look for those fish. Look for those tails. Look for those mud plumes. And all you're going to do with these fish is put on a single fly on kind of a long 3X or 2X leader. So I like my carp leader to be mm, 9 to 10 feet. And then coming in at that 2x, 3x kind of size. Um, those flies. So I have three different weights of flies. So they're all crayfish. All I'm doing with these different weights is having an option for different weight or different depths of fish. So if that fish, I think, is about five feet or deeper, then I'm going to use my heavy fly. It's not going to make a big splash. That fly is going to sink without scaring them. If that fish is now three feet or less, what I'm going to do is use my medium weight, my little bead chain eye, and that will get down without spooking them. And then I have my unweighted if they're like a foot or less, and I don't want to cast anything too heavy that's going to make too big a splash and scare them. So three different weights of flies, very, very important if you're going to get serious about uh, chasing down some carp. And then leading the fish. So ideally, you have feeding fish feeding carp that are progressing in a, in a line. They're coming left to right. There's kind of a pace consistency to how fast they're moving and kind of where they're at. I want to cast four or five feet in front of those fish so that I don't plunk it on their nose. I want that fly to sink. And then I want that carp to catch up to my fly. I'm not trying to react and strip and get them to charge it. I want this to be their idea. They want the whole time, all carp needs to do is think it's their idea and they'll eat the darn thing. So I want them to intercept my fly. And then right when their nose is on that carp fly, I start to twitch it. I'm not even stripping. I'm twitching to the point of just making some of the feathers wiggle. I'm not trying to aggressively remove it from them. I'm just trying to give it a lifelike kind of flutter. Uh, and then after they've gone, it didn't accept it, or maybe they did take it. Um, before you recast, you want to make sure that those fish have left. You don't want to pick up and recast when that fish is still right under your fly. You might snag them, which will break your rod, and two, you'll spook them, and then these fish will, will splatter, and it'll take another hour before they come back to where you are. So lead the fish. Be very quiet with your presentation. Be very quiet with your approach to the, to the water or river. Um, and just take your time with the cast. If they didn't eat your fly, wait for them to go past before you pick up and then recast in front of them at least four or five feet and let them catch up to your fly. Uh, finding carp, walk and observe. They're gonna be in the shallow waters. They're gonna be in the muddy areas. They're not gonna be, they, they are, but you can't see them. They're gonna be in the deeper stuff too, but we look for the shallow areas, the inlets, the outlets, anywhere where there's a uh, uh, differentiation the slope from deep to shallow that's where they come up to feed are in those shallows so it's all sight fishing in the shallows very very exciting a lot of a lot of fun um this is the only option or the only difference now is i don't want a windy day for the carp i need to be able to see them it's not like the bass or the the smallmouth i don't like those windy days because i can't see where they're at i can't see where i need to put my fly so if you get an afternoon that's warm and not windy, that's ideal for carp fishing. Um, and then blind casting, you know, it's kind of fruitless. You really just don't want to say, oh, there might be a carp over here, might be a carp over there. You can do it, but it's really not going to give you the success if you can't see them. So if you can't see them, um, you're really going to be at a detriment, to say the least. But they're a lot of fun to sight fish and stock. And then seasonality, May through September is the peak. They're warm water fish. So the warmer the water, the better. 
Uh, you'll see them in the summertime spawning. They're going to jump over each other. They're going to have these big balls of fish. Uh, go ahead and cast right into those big spawning balls because there's going to be someone on the periphery that is going to eat that's not actively engaged in the spawn. But if you see in these lakes, these big explosions of fish, they're spawning carp is what they are, just to, for your own information. And then warmer the water, the shallower they get. You can see them with their backs out of the water. You can see them in six, eight inches of water. So don't be, uh, you know, don't think there's not a fish there because it's too shallow. That's that's not the case. They can be in any any depth of water and they just disappear in the murk. They can appear out of nowhere. They call them the ghost fish and they can disappear into nowhere. They just, it's amazing how well camouflaged they are. And then late afternoons, evenings, they love that hot water as that light changes. Uh, great, again, great after work. Um, summertime fishing, uh, lower light, they get much more aggressive and low light right at dusk uh, on those warm, non-windy days. So just a lot of fun. They're huge. So not exactly five weight fish. Uh, I blew up a rod on 30 fish or 30 inch fish a couple of weeks ago, four weight. That was, that was my own silliness. So if you're going to, if you're going to go for carp, try to get a six weight or a seven weight um, so that you, you don't extend your warranty with Orbis non-stop and be out of a rod for six weeks, but a lot of fun. And then here's some nice pics of uh, some carp from around the area. So that's about what I got for you here, guys. Hold on one second. Okay. So give me one second here and then uh, get off of this. Appreciate you listening to me. My wife's going to flip the situation here. You guys there? Best job, for, best man for the job is a woman. You need Bella. Oh, yeah, right. She's, yeah, they're in the, yeah. <laughs> There's my IT tech support. <laughs> hey, Chris, you had a question from a little bit earlier. Yeah, from, what's up? Uh, Ned. And I think it was in the Smolik presentation, and he was asking about kind of using a flow tube to fish back towards the structure with smallies. Oh, 100%, guys. Yeah, I was catering. You know, I, I left this out on purpose. If, if you do have a boat or a pontoon boat, uh, belly boat, man, the world's your oyster with these ponds. I was trying to cater it towards folks that, um, you know, are just like me, are just going to wade for off the shore of the rock dam face. But if you have a boat, you can... I mean, you control a whole dam face. Um, if you know, I, I'll make a, I'll make a cast just to get my line started, and then I would just troll horizontally off, off these dam faces with my boat. I won't even recast. I would just kind of keep my rod tip uh, pointed between my toes or my legs, and just keep slowly paddling. Um, and yeah, I mean, when they when they bite it, you'll you'll instantly feel that. But a, a belly boat's a wonderful way. To, Awesome way to do it. Yeah, great hey, asset. Chris, yeah, I was over by just as an FYI, I was over by Salisbury Park today, and they've got that all torn up right now. And yeah, it's, I saw drained, that. it's drained down quite a ways. And yeah, up, so so hopefully they're going to be done by by May. And what they're doing is uh, raising the. I saw it too, Bill. They're raising the height of it so that uh, they can fill it with more water, which would be cool. But thank you for letting me know. Yeah, yeah. Save Salisbury uh, maybe till middle of May, guys. Build construction. Yeah, Cindy was asking whether a woolly bugger might work for carp and bass, kind of like a crayfish mode. Yep, absolutely. Any generic streamer, right? So those bass are just going to be reactionary. Um, great leech. I mean, a woolly bugger could be a leech in a brown color, it could be a, a crawfish imitation. Um, yeah, don't go, don't go out and spend crazy money on all these crazy streamers you're not gonna use. Throw what you have for, for bass. Uh, yeah, throw a black cone-headed bugger, absolutely, 100%. Could be a good leech. Yep. Yeah, you can still buy a couple of things at the store though, come on now. Oh yeah, no, no, there's great ones to have for sure. <laughs> and a, and a cone-head bugger is a good one. Yeah, we've got, we'll get the good spring collection in and uh, we'll, we got gray flies over at Park Meadows. Chris, I have a question. Yeah. And, it, and it's not really about south side fishing, but have you ever fished up at the Rocky Mountain Arsenal? 
I haven't gone up there in probably a decade. It's funny. Brian and I were talking about that. Um, I have not gone up there in easily a decade. Yeah, but I have gone up there in the past for those bass in the in the pike. I've caught a bass up there in a meat whistle. Oh, cool. that's a great one. That's an awesome one. Don't like yep. the name of it, but it worked great. <laughs> yeah, that's a great fly. I think uh, you mentioned you were up on Aurora Reservoir this morning when it was like uh, 15 degrees out there. What were you doing? <laughs> Trout fishing. <laughs> <laughs> Basically the rainbows. Yeah, I was an idiot. It was, it was 21 when I got there and when, and my rod was frozen for an hour and a half. But I was looking for the rainbows on the West Dam, exactly where I was telling you guys to fish for the smallmouth spawn, the rainbow spawn's happening. So I, I was up on the dam. Uh, and over by the swim area, looking for those spawning rainbows. Uh, but that was, it was more to get out of the house. <laughs> it was a horrible idea. <laughs> but it's a uh, case in point. You want to go catch some trout in town right now. Uh, go over to the west side of Aurora, just where I showed you on the dam, and have fun with those uh, rainbows making laps in there. Yep. Yeah, so, uh, so is that C470 pond, is that between uh, Colorado and University? Um, like there's kind of like a 7-Eleven by there? Yeah, so it's just east, or I'm sorry, yeah, it's just west of Colorado. All right. Uh, and you have, those co you have those apartments right there. Yeah. And it, yeah, you got it, man. So it's just to the east of those apartments and just to the west of Colorado. It's just, you won't even see it on, on county line, but there's a little retaining dirt wall right there. And that little hidey hole's right in there, dude. Yeah, and for me, for me, it's like a two mile uh, bike ride. So oh, I keep sweet. telling my, yeah, my dad thinks it doesn't exist. And I keep showing him Google, like Google Earth pictures of it. <laughs> All right, yeah. now I've got some information. But hey, Michael, we'll have to take you out there. Yeah. Yeah. Please yeah. do. It does exist. <laughs> yeah. So if, if, if you park, um, I don't know if you can park where you were showing um, on your map, you know, at the Copper Canyon or whatever that is. Um, yeah, start my video. But if you park across the way on the 7-Eleven side, there's what used to be some sort of a dog park or yeah, or, um, yeah there's a park down there. And you can park in that parking lot above the Euro collision place okay. and right. then just walk, walk across up. the street where you have the flashing lights on Colorado yeah. and then follow the bike path past that first set of apartments and then just look to your right. You can't miss it. Yeah. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah. And uh, again, I live, a, it's like two miles, like a two mile bike ride from my house. So cool. yeah, me too. Yeah, I'll check it out this weekend. Cool. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. We'll go get hey, Chris. it. Chris, yeah. can you park in the Copper Canyon complex? They used to have two spots that uh, were stated reserved uh, reserved bike trail use, and mm -hmm. there's a there's an opening in the gate on that corner. Uh, and I've never been hassled. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to get anyone legality troubles, but there used to be signs there that said, you know, uh, bike trail use parking. So, and there's a well, gap would, in the trail. I wouldn't but, know uh, if you were, or you could ride your bike in to fish. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's yeah. totally it. I mean, it's, it's gotten pretty bushy when we were there last year. Um, yeah. We went with our two weights. Six yeah. two weights. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Good. That's fun. It was pretty bushy in there. Yeah. Um, I feel like. On the west side of it. It's got I feel like cleaning some of those logs out of there this year. But anyway. Yeah. There yeah. used to be a, a board that went into the water on the yeah. east side. Yeah, and I think it's gone now, but you know, since you kind of stand on that border, gave you something to stand on. Right, right. Yeah, fun two way. Chris, regarding uh, pontoon boats, if you're fishing any of those lakes uh, for a South Suburban Park and Rec, uh, in particular Trail Mark and the ponds along 470, there they do not allow no correct or uh, yep. pontoon boats. Yep. You're totally correct. So Quincy and Aurora, uh, nor does Salisbury. So Quincy and Aurora, check your regs before you go exploring on your own. This is just a, a quick list, but yeah, good point, Buzz. Do a little, do a little research on the regs for a little area you're going to explore. Make sure waiting and or boating's allowed if you're going to do that. Yep, good point. And that's same same thing at Rocky Mountain Arsenal. Yep. 
Great presentation, Chris. I really enjoyed it. I love your passion for this type of fishing uh, to come through. So well, good job. You. Well, thank you. <laughs> need to meet you out there someday. Yeah, I agree. I'll be living at Aurora. <laughs> at Aurora, yeah. <laughs> Hey, Chris, do you spend more time at Quincy or Aurora, or is that according to where you are in the season and what you're fishing for? You know, I spend more time at Aurora just because it has um, more, uh, just the species that I'm after. I want to get bigger smallmouth, and I know Aurora has that. They might be more numerous at Quincy, uh, but I, I know what lives in Aurora. So I'd rather put in some time for an 18, 20 inch, uh, three, four pounder at Aurora. And then you also catch a lot of trout when I'm fishing for smallmouth at Aurora as well. And I like the size of the trout at Aurora, those, you know, those big football fish. Um, How late can you I fish like that. trout out there? All year. They're, like, they're out there even in the middle of the summer? The middle summer. of summer. Yeah, okay. it'll be morning, morning stuff before it gets too hot. Mm -hmm. uh, but you for can fish that all year for for trout too hot in the evening or? yeah yeah it just gets toasty mm -hmm. have you have you fished the east side of the pine reef uh not this year no i haven't gone over since ice out this year uh it's shallow over in there and my daughter takes the grandchildren down to the southwest corner or the southern end of the dam yeah and there's a corner down in there that's pretty good i mean they're throwing worms out but oh yeah yep that's a great spot too. Yeah, I usually mention that when I say fish the the dam face, but that corner where the old pylons are and right. at the end of the dam, that's a great corner too for little sunnies. For it's little got a fish. fairly shallow shoreline around the lake, and I was wondering if that would be good early in the morning or late in the evening if bass would come into the shallows in there. Oh, I'm sure they would. Yo, yeah, absolutely. That would be, yeah, not a spot to be overlooked. Yeah, it's just hard to cast with the, there's a lot of trees in that little corner. Um, but yeah, definitely a good spot to explore. Yep. Any particular way to fish the little bay in the southeast corner? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, not sure. You'd have to stand on the rocks and kind of roll cast into it, I would think. But not okay. sure, buddy. Yeah, not sure. But that Always damn face. Good information. Damn face is fun. Oh, wonderful presentation. I'm tracking up on the uh, on the pictures that you posted with me in it and Dave <laughs> Papano as a little guy. Yeah, those were Brian's <laughs> uh, Brian's stash of photos. He he helped me put this together big time. Yeah, Back in, this was like yeah. Thank <laughs> you for the credit use. <laughs> yes, I, I think that Dave was like 14, <laughs> and we were fishing with his little brother who was six, and I don't know if he's even on the call. The joke was catching the number of fish of your age. He was only six, so the kid kept catching. The little six-year-old was catching, catching, catching. Oh, that's cool. And he had that kid's <laughs> rod. I can't remember the name of it. Um, Echo Gecko. Yeah, yeah. Echo Gecko. Yeah. Oh, yeah. fun. Yeah. Fun. He used to get the crappie at the crappie. <laughs> well, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm glad. That was a great presentation, Chris. Yeah, and I, Chris you, and I originally kind of talked about doing this a couple of months from now, and I'm, I'm really glad that he could actually change his schedule and kind of move it up. So I truly, truly appreciate that, Chris, as we all do. Yeah, man. That was great, guys. Look forward to seeing you guys at the store. Any other questions for Chris before we shut it down? Good stuff tonight, guys. Scott, I'll turn it back over to you then. All right. Hey, Chris, thank you very much. That was a yeah. great presentation. All right. Uh, I don't have anything else on the agenda. We were uh, whoa, it's almost nine o'clock. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, everybody. And I uh, appreciate uh, everybody logging on and uh, listening to the presentations. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again uh, next month. With that, I think we'll call it uh, adjourned. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.